draft.com. And with that, let's welcome on a Browns legend, Tom Darden, the franchise all-time leader in there interceptions, he is. has figured out the tech issues, the system glitches have been corrected, <laughs> and there is our guy, Tom. How you doing today, Tom? Hey, I'm doing all right, guys. How you guys doing? Great. We're, We're great. Good. It's great to have you on, Tom Darden. For those that, and I imagine a lot of in our audience are just too young to remember, um, but Tom Darden, uh, once upon a time, wasn't just the best defensive back for the Browns. He was among the best defensive backs in the NFL. Uh, I think a couple of years, or at least once, I know you led the NFL in interceptions. You're the Browns' all-time interception leader. And guys, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that record is going to be very difficult to break because interceptions don't happen yeah. nearly as often now as they once did. Tom, why is that? Why is today's our, our quarterbacks just better are, are defensive backs taking fewer risks? Why are interceptions down so much? Uh, my personal feeling is that, uh, number one, quarterbacks are a lot better. Uh, the ball doesn't stay as much up in the air as it used to. Uh, quarterbacks are throwing ropes like <laughs> like only a few quarterbacks could do that when I was playing. Um, and also, I think because offenses now realize that – you can go down the field if you go six, seven, eight yards instead of 15 or 14 like we used to have. Uh, you know, the outs were run at 12, 13 yards instead of, That's crazy. Uh, you know, today I think they run more like six to eight yards. Right. So the ball's not in the air as long as it used to be. We have 45 interceptions. That's crazy. crazy. That, that, it just, it, that, those numbers look insane because today, you know, now you, you almost have to gamble um, to get interceptions and to have 45 is, you know, we, you know, this is no shot at Greg Newsom. Greg Newsom has been in the league what going on his third year and has not had one interception. And it's a tremendous And it's a back. great, is it a great cover corner? Um, what do you guys, uh, do you think the, the defensive backfield has, um, I would say, evolved to a point? Um, nowadays, you got guys who are considered just the slot and, and guys on the outside are just, you know, your main two corners. Um, did that, when did that evolve and did you guys play it a little differently um, in terms of the three cornerbacks and, and slot cornerbacks with different technique and responsibilities? No, we had, uh, you know, we had certain guys, like when I played Clarence Scott, who was in my mind, one of the best cornerbacks around. I mean, he stayed on the outside receiver. He stayed outside. Um, actually, I played in the slot uh, sometimes uh, as a free safety and a lot when I was a strong safety, uh, but we didn't have the one-on-one -on -one coverage like they do today. Um, we played a lot of zone, played a lot of double zone, uh, which we start actually my, during my tenure was when the double zone became popular. Um, and the double zone helped a lot because the outside corners were jamming the outside receivers. So as a free safety, I knew that the outside receivers were not going to get down the field that quickly. So I could scan and see where the quarterback was looking. Generally, he'd be looking where the two receiver side was, whether that was a, a wide out and a tight end or whether it was two wide receivers. So I could kind of move in that direction, knowing that nine times out of 10, he's going to throw the ball in that direction. Tom, is it my imagination or our, are the teams in the league playing a lot less bump now than, right. than they, they, they used to just get do it. up on the line and they were in your, I mean, they just were jamming everybody. And now it just <sighs> seems like there's so many free releases. When did that happen? And why do you think that happened? Well, it, it was a transition in the league. Even when I was playing, um, it started when I came in in 72 we could beat the receiver up all over the field. <laughs> so, you know, offenses started whining. Uh, the fans started whining. So they said, no, you cannot touch the receiver for five yards down the field. And, um, oh, let, let me make sure I get this right. After I'm five old yards now, down so the field. Hard. Yeah, you, uh, you, could be on, you could be in a, a bump position and you could bump him as long as he was in front of you. Right. Yeah. Once he got to the side of you, you had to keep your hands off of him. Yeah. And especially when he got behind you, 
You had to keep your hands off of him. So our thing was you got to keep him on the line of scrimmage as long as you possibly can. Uh, in today's world, those guys can't even touch the receivers. I, I feel bad for them. They, uh, you know, you, you're you asking a guy to run backwards and stay with these guys that are running 4-2, four 4-1s, four you know, things that I never never saw. Thank God I never saw. <laughs> was... uh, Tom, Billy Roberts here. Um, to put things into perspective, you know, uh, the numbers you had – we're in the 70s, you know, where the passing game hadn't evolved to where it is today. Do you ever Correct. sit back and wonder, like, man, that 45 might be 60, 65 interceptions if you played in today's game? Do you ever get a little jealous, or do you feel like it was easier back then? That's a good question. Um, I, I'd like to believe, because I'm a firm believer that if you're a good athlete, mm -hmm. you're a good athlete. I don't care what. You know, I look at Jim Brown's take. Jim Brown was one of the best. He was, he probably could run over people <coughs> in his time. He could run over guys, maybe not as much, because guys are bigger, stronger, faster today. But the great ones, in my opinion, could play in any era, in any time. Um, I just think football is football. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say that uh, obviously – being an old man now, there's no way I could get out on the field now. But comparing the, the eras is always a difficult thing. But uh, I really believe guys don't intercept passes like they used to because they don't have great hands in the secondary like they used to. Tom, to that point, you know, the 45 uh, career interceptions for the Cleveland Browns, uh, I'm looking at this list, man. And the last active player that came even close to that was Joe Hayden. Do you think your record will ever be broken? All records are made to be broken, I believe. But when that's going to happen, uh, things will have to evolve a little bit. You know, especially now, um, you look at the offenses, they're taking what the, what you, the defense gives them. If, if, if we got to throw the ball four or five yards down the field, I mean, I guess Tom Brady made a, a living out of doing that. Yeah, sure you did. looked at him at New England, uh, he threw the ball down the field five, six, seven yards. Um, we didn't, it was not like when, not, when Terry Bradshaw, uh, Kenny Anderson, Joe Namath, you know, all of those guys that, that I played against, they would throw the ball 12 to 15 yards down the field all the time. Tom, it doesn't do you, happen like that anymore. Do you have a favorite defensive back on this current Cleveland Browns team? A favorite defensive back. Yeah. Yeah, Erich Barnes was my favorite. Erich Barnes could – he could take your head off. And see, that was another – that's another thing. When I came in the league, I was taught that if you take the head, the body will follow. Right? <laughs> so we, our thing was you got to knock somebody out when they come into your area so that when they start – Coming into your area, they start looking. They start uh, their eyes start twitching, going from looking at you to trying to find the ball instead of staying on the ball. And when you get receivers thinking that they're going to get hit, many times they'll drop the ball. I, I just looked up because I, I was curious. Uh, I think the gold standard of defensive backs is Deion Sanders. I think most of us would would agree that, especially when it comes to cover skills. Now, I know a lot of times teams would just X his zone of the field off, like they, they weren't throwing his way. But he had 53 career interceptions, mm -hmm. which is only right. eight more than Tom yeah. Darden <clears throat> had for, for his career. So not only are we talking about a record that I think is going yeah. to stand for I good, do too. just because you, you, you basically have to have a guy with five interceptions, nine straight seasons to tie him. Five interceptions will lead the league. Yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, Tom, your record is safe for two reasons. One, because 45 is – that's a, that's ridiculous. That's amazing. That's just a testament to how great – how much of a great player you were. And also, guys aren't staying in one situation that long nowadays. You get what yeah. I'm saying? Everybody's that's chasing true. the bag. You put two, three years together, you're looking for your next bag. And if your current team isn't going to give it to you, you're going somewhere else to get it. So even if your young guy is on pace to maybe tie or break your record – 
and let's say the Browns don't want to pay him that money, they're gone, and then it's on to the next person. Your record is safe for another decade or so. Yeah. So I'm here to say your record is safe. Congratulations. That's You had an amazing <laughs> career. I well, agree. Yeah, and I yeah. think I can route you up, but that's here for another day. So, <laughs> Tom, the one thing that I really want to get into with you is, obviously, uh, you were part of the Cardiac Kids, Cleveland Browns, and, uh, you know, I, I know it's got to be painful to talk about the, the loss to the Raiders, who eventually went on to win the Super Bowl after they defeated the Browns 14-12 to in really one of the most memorable games in Cleveland Browns history. What do you remember most about that game, about that day? It was it was just horribly cold, that I remember. Uh, and I remember we had to change shoes to go from cleats to uh, tennis shoes because the ground was frozen. You could not get any traction with cleats in the secondary. So we changed to tennis shoes. Um, I also remember that we on defense felt like we controlled that game. Uh, we felt that there was no way that Raiders were going to score on us. Uh, for some reason, we just, you know, uh, Marty Schottenheimer had put together a great uh, defensive game plan. Um, they, you know, like obviously because of the weather, it was difficult for guys like Cliff Branch, who was probably one of the fastest guys in the league at that time. He had to, he had to, to ratchet it down a little bit because he couldn't stand up. We tried to cut after running so fast. So it was really in our favor, I believe, defensively, uh, that game. Uh, plus, when you, you get into a game situation where you feel like you are controlling things, I mean, that doesn't happen too often. And you just feel so confident and so good about being on the field our defense felt we could really win that game on defense that day. That that game was defined by red right 88, which um, was the Brian Sipe pass on second down when the team was already in field goal range late in the fourth quarter. But because the field conditions were so bad and, and the weather was bad, the wind was blowing, I think Don Cockcroft had missed two rather short Correct. field goals earlier in the game. So the team Correct. should have been up. So Sam Rattigliano is looking at this saying, well, we can run the ball on second down, run the ball on third down, try to get it closer, and then try another field goal to win 15-14. Instead, he calls red right 88. The ball is intercepted, and that was that. What was your thought as you saw Sight drop back to pass on second down there? And take us through the play and your emotions after. Well, first of all, I couldn't understand why we were throwing the ball at that time. You're uh, not alone. And especially because of the field conditions and the, uh, the you know, the, the conditions in the uh, stadium as, as a whole, um, it, it, it lends itself to, you know, controlling the ball through the run. Um, but... You know, Brian Sipe had a heck of a year that year. Our offense, you know, I don't know how many times they pulled us out uh, in the last few minutes of the game. I think it was seven or eight times we won games in the last few minutes of the game. Um, so, you know, you really couldn't argue with that fact. I guess the only thing that I would say to Brian was, why don't you throw the ball in the Lake Erie? That's all I got to say. <laughs> right. Which I think Sam is the last thing Sam told him. If Ozzy isn't open, throw it into Lake Erie, and we all know we all know uh, how it ended. And you know, you mentioned Sipe was the AFC Offensive Player of the Year that year. He's throwing to Ozzy Newsom on paper, minus the conditions. It looks like a smart play. Unfortunately, it uh, it led to one of the more memorable heartbreak moments in Cleveland Browns history. You know, you know, Tom. I, sometimes when I, I I talk to the greats, the, the you know the OG so to uh, so to speak, um, that played for the Browns, um, do you do you kind of share in the the angst and I, I guess the pain of not being not not able to see your team on Super Bowl Sunday? I was telling my dad, I said, 
you know, it, 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 there's always a generation of people that grow up and you, you when I grew up, I watched it with my dad and, and there was this foregone conclusion that one day that the Browns would get there and we would watch the game together because, hey, you know, we both young, we both doing it. And then now uh, year after year, I'm 41. Now I see my dad getting older. He, you know, he's he's approaching 70 and it, there's this thing in the back of my mind who, that says that that might not happen. I might not, he, he might not be here to see it. Um, is, is, is there ever a thought in your back of your mind? Like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that we have not made it to the pinnacle, which is to go to the Super Bowl yet. It's interesting that you should, uh, ask that question. Uh, when I came to Cleveland in 1972, uh, we won our division and, uh, went to the playoffs to play the Miami Dolphins down in Miami who were undefeated, uh, and everybody was calling them the best team in the history of the NFL and you know, all of that kind of stuff. We had them beat. We had them beat down in Miami. Uh, I'll never forget uh, Jim Kick ran me over at the goal line on one play that scored a touchdown. That was one of the worst feelings I ever had. Um, <laughs> but there was a pass interference uh, that was called against Billy Andrews when uh, we had a coverage where uh, uh, one of our outside linebackers would go to the wide receiver and play the inside position on that wide receiver. So Ben Davis, who was the quarterback, could play on the outside. So we had, and then I'm in the middle. So if the receiver ran downfield, ran to the middle, I'd pick him up, or at least they if they tried to throw the ball. But anyway, when they called that interference on Billy Andrews, it was like they took the, the wind out of our sails because we had them third and long. Mm -hmm. uh, we were right at midfield, I think, or a little bit over the midfield area. Uh, we stopped them there. It was in the, I think it was in the third quarter, or early in the fourth quarter. We were up. Uh, we lost 20 to 12, so we had to be up 20 to 7, something like that. Wow. I can't even remember. But anyway. That interference call gave them a first down. They go in, uh, and uh, it wasn't even Bob Greasy. It was Errol Morrill, who right. was the quarterback. And uh, they go in and score, um, and somehow we just never recuperated. And we ended up losing that. And they go on to be the only team to go undefeated through their entire season. We should have won. And my thought was, Okay, this is a, okay. We lost this one. We could have played better. We should have played better. But I'm going. I'm going to be back there. I know I'm going to be back there. And lo and behold, it wasn't until from '72 to what '81 mm. I went back to the playoffs. Wow, wow. And and that year too, uh, losing to a, uh, a Raiders team <clears throat> at home. The game was here at Municipal Stadium, and uh, the Raiders went on to win the Super Bowl. Tom, thanks for catching up with us. We appreciate, appreciate it. It's, uh, it's always good hearing your stories. And uh, we got our eyes on that number 45, man. I don't think anybody's going to ever come close to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope someone does, to be honest with you, because that means – that we're intercepting a lot of passes and hopefully winning a lot of games. <laughs> I like your line of thought there. I like your line of thought. Sandusky Appreciate native, you. Michigan grad, Tom Thank Darby. you, guys. Tom, great to see you. Thank you, guys. Great to see Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. He was a ball hawk. I mean, he was just always around it.